it is my pleasure to introduce Steve James as our luncheon speaker. Steve is currently AMI manager for AEP Ohio. What is AMI? I'm glad you asked. It stands for Advanced Meter Infrastructure. Steve and his team are responsible for the AMI deployment project, as well as ongoing operations of the AMI system once implemented. He is a 38-year employee of AEP and has held several positions in meter operations, customer services, corporate support, and AEP's IT group during the course of his career. Finally, Steve is a lifelong resident of Central Ohio and is really looking forward to receiving his AMI meter later this year. A lot of you in this room probably have already received yours. Without further delay, I will let Steve share his over-the-top, exciting information about the latest happenings in the electric utility world. And yes, I'm being sarcastic. Steve? <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to come in today and, and talk to you about uh, Smart Grid, uh, AEP, the things that we're doing. It's very exciting to me. Uh, Renee, when she read my, uh, my biography, you know, I, I've worked a lot of places in AEP. I always tease people that I can't decide what I want to be when I grow up. And so uh, now I'm working on the, uh, on the AMI project, but I hired into AEP in, in 1980, a couple months out of high school as a meter reader. And all those years ago, if you looked out back and you saw somebody in blue uniform walking through the backyard, uh, reading your meter, they were carrying IBM punch cards that had marked cents on them. We took a pencil, marked the reading down off of the dial, and then we'd bring them back in, they would get put in a rack, we'd take them down uh, town to the old CSP building downtown, CNSOE, because I wasn't even an AEP employee when I came, came to work for the electric company. It was still CNSOE at the time, Columbus and Southern Ohio Electric Company. And uh, they would run those card, uh, cards through the reader on rain days. It was a nightmare for the people that worked in the data processing group because those cards would get soaked. And uh, my, my first boss told me, you know, when we, uh, you need to get out of the department in five years. In 1980, told me that because we'll be driving a truck down the street uh, reading the meters off of uh, radio signals. It took a little longer for us than five years, but uh, I'm excited to tell you that uh, we're making great advancements. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the projects and things going on gone in AEP. So for those of you, I, I think hopefully everybody knows uh, who we are. We serve 1.5 million customers in Ohio, provide uh, power to 1,000 communities and 60, um, located in 61 of the state's 88 counties. Uh, we're in western Ohio, eastern Canton uh, area, uh, southern Ohio uh, headquarters uh, for our southern operations in Chillicothe and Athens. Um, so. Uh, the point of all this is, is, is trying to provide our customers, you all, and, uh, and uh, with better service, better information. So let's get right down, uh, right down to it. Smart grid technologies. In our smart grid, you think of smart meters, but we actually have really three prongs to this project that we're working on. Um, the first is uh, the most visible, and that's our um, um, 900,000 AMI meters that we're installing throughout the state of Ohio. Um, some of you may be familiar and some of you may live in Northeast Columbus or Columbus District, New Albany, Westerville. We installed 130,000 AMI meters back in 2009 through 2013. It was called our Smart Grid Demonstration Project. We partnered with um, the Department of Energy and we really tested out some unique, uh, unique technologies. Um, uh, there was a lot of things that were kind of experimental, real-time pricing for residential customers. Um, we were doing uh, NAS batteries, um, uh, we were doing um, distributed generation, uh, community energy storage. And uh, after that, we, we, we put together a proposal to do a portion, a big portion of the rest of our service territory. The 900,000 meters will take us to um, shade over a million. That's not quite all of our customers. And, and this deployment is really focused on um, um, compact areas because the technology we're using with the radio frequency is uh, it works better and it's more efficient in, in dense population areas. It does work in far rural areas. Um, we're, it, we want to deploy AMI to all of our customers, automated metering infrastructure. Um, and we're evaluating the technologies uh, uh, now for our, what we're calling our phase three deployment, the, the 900,000 we're calling phase two. 
Um, but that's not all. So, you know, there's benefits, I'll get to them in uh, by the smart meters, but um, uh, distribu uh, distribution automation, and distribution automation is simply, uh, we're trying to put smart controllers out on the end of our distribution circuits, strategically located um, uh, points along there. We have data coming back to us in real time so that we can uh, uh, judge the health of those circuits. Um, our goal is, if there is an outage, to be able to reroute power uh, through um, different areas on the, on the circuits, different paths, so that we minimize the number of customers that are impacted. And by also having those smart devices out there, we can judge the health of, uh, of the circuits themselves, our, our distribution network, and actually catch problems before they cause a larger outage and roll crews to make repairs. And finally, um, volt VAR optimization. And this is actually the project that uh, um, our regulators, um, um, environmentalists like the most of, of all the three. Um, I'm not an engineer, um, I'm actually not much uh, far removed from my days as a meter reader, but I always explain it simply, if you think about it, back at a power plant there's a dial there, right? It says how much electrons do I need to push down those lines. What volt VAR optimization does is it puts smart sensors on the end of the circuits and instead of doing engineered estimates of the, um, of the load that we have to push out on the lines to serve the, the customers at any one time, we have real-time sensors that are telling us this is exactly what we need to serve. And so you can take that dial and just inch it back a little bit to the tune of about three to four percent savings. Now, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but we're talking about megawatt hours. We think about the benefits of that from, you know, not having to build additional power plants, not having to, you know, burn additional fossil fuels. There's a lot of environmental benefits and cost benefits and reliability benefits, and it pushes all the way down our, down our circuit. So. Uh, AMI meters, we plan to be done in Columbus by mid-next year, uh, less than a year from now. Um, Columbus District, I, I assume most people live in Columbus, and let me ask you a question. Does anybody know they have their smart meter installed? Yeah, it's got the blue face on it, right? Yeah, so if you still have the dial meter or the red face meter and you live in Columbus, uh, we're going to get to you. We're, we're installing meters today, um, finishing up northwest Columbus. Northeast was primarily done. Uh, we're out in southeast uh, Columbus today. and. I said I'm excited about getting my smart meter. I live in Grove City, so southwest Columbus is just the last, uh, last area to get it. Uh, we did finish um, mostly Delaware, which is part of Columbus District uh, for us operationally. So uh, distribution automation has begun, and so is volt bar optimization. And what we did is we prioritized circuits based upon uh, where we get the best benefit. For distribution automation, it's really about taking a look at the reliability numbers, what circuits do we have the most problems on from, from outages, uh, volt bar optimization, we're looking at the loads on the circuits for prioritization. So those projects will take uh, probably about the next uh, um, five and a half years now. So, all right. So those of you who have the meter, that's what it looks like. It's got a blue face. Um, it's digital. There's radio module inside the meter. The way that the technology works is um, it's radio frequency. Meters talk to meters. Uh, they hop, carrying data across, all encrypted, all, uh, all secure. We have devices that we're already done installing on our poles. Um, some are called relays, and it simply passes data along to it gets to a collection point called an access point. And um, what we do is uh, cellular backhaul from those uh, collectors back to us in the back office uh, so we can get the, the data off the meter. It's not just uh, read data, which that's one of the main benefits, is that we no longer have to access your property anymore to read your meters. You know, if you've got a, a fence, you keep it locked, children, pool in the backyard, dogs, um, all that goes out the window. Those icy days when we couldn't get out and read the meters because it's unsafe for the meters to be on the road, thing of the past with these AMI meters. The other thing that these meters do, amongst other, a lot of uh, things that they bring back data, is there's a, a, a message that comes back called a last gas when that meter gets ready to lose power. And it's the last thing it does, it says I'm losing power. We're working on automation today. Our goal, our goal is to know you're out before you do. If you're at work, we get that message, we can roll a truck. You know, you think about the typical model today is, you know, a storm blows through, you know, it knocks a tree limb down on your service drop, the wire leading from our poles to the back of your house, and you come home and you're out of electricity, knock on the neighbor's door, you know, hey, are you out too? You know, and then you get together and then you call us. But with, uh, with this automated system, we'll, we'll know. All right. Um, so we talked about the two benefits, better, um, better outage management, better outage response time, um, accurate monthly readings. 
uh, but, but also, too, is the information that we provide to you all to help manage your, your energy usage. Um, these meters not only record register readings, and that's the typical model. We walk back and read the dials this month. The next month we come out, we read the dials. Simple math is so many kilowatt hours you used. There's a rate per kilowatt hour. Produce the bill. Uh, we're bringing back daily register readings off this, these meters through the network. But we're also bringing back what's called 15-minute interval usage blocks. And it's your usage every 15 minutes. When you sum that data all up, it gives you a, a good look at the profile of when you're using electricity. Right now, if you go to APOhio.com Home Energy Reports and you have a smart meter, um, let me get this. So um, it's, as we call it our energy dashboard, it's available at apohio.com slash home energy reports. Dashboard allows you to view usage data at monthly, daily, and 15 minute interval periods. But it's if you have a smart meter, because we're not bringing that data back on the old analog meters. Uh, if you have a smart meter, you can log into the dashboard. You can, use, you can get to it through your My AEP account, your regular customer online account. You can sign up for high bill, um, high bill usage alerts. And uh, these are the reports that are out here on the, on the side, I think there's a, yeah, there we go, reports on, on the side um, that are available on the web. One is a high usage alert and the other is your weekly energy reports. The de energy dashboard also allows customers to sign up for a home energy profile and you can see ways that you can save based upon your usage. We're also working on um, a smartphone application that will provide real-time connectivity for you to the meter. Now, it will involve um, a, a, a box uh, that connects to, it's called the Zigbee chip inside the meter, and uh, it'll bring back real-time data so you can see instantaneous demand. Um, I'm not sure exactly when we're gonna roll it out, probably sometime early next year. And then, it, that to me is the most powerful um, information that you can have because you can actually see like, wow, my energy using spike is a spike. Why? You start walking around the house looking for your teenagers that are running video games and right, you know, the stereo and the TV and not watching any of it because they're on the phone uh, texting their friends. Um, my boss, I work for uh, Scott Osterholt, and uh, he works for the, the uh, VP of distribution, Selwyn Diaz. Um, he's distribution VP for the state of Ohio. We got him set up um, with this information, and he said he became a terror to his family because he's running around trying to squeeze savings out of his electric bill and showing them where they're being inefficient. So I'm going to pause there because um, that's kind of the smart grid aspect. I'm going to talk about um, smart city here in a minute, but are there any questions? Uh, is there any effort to integrate this with the, uh, the water meter reading operation? Because, you know, you can't have, you really don't have a runaway electric situation. If you have a broken pipe, which I had to experience one time, and a $9,000 water bill, oh. yeah. uh, it, would make, it makes a big difference. The public is exposed to all kinds of accidents with the water. Yeah. Uh, any work about integrating this with the uh, water uh, reading, with the electric reading? Um, I do know that the city of Columbus, and I don't, is there any Columbus, um, city of Columbus utilities folks out here? I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. They are looking at, right now, um, going automated with... Uh, with um, their meter readings. Um, it's a little bit different. You know, we've got electricity running to our meters, and so um, it, it, it's powered with a, uh, with a water meter. You actually have to set a device on top of that. It's got an optical display, battery operated. It doesn't bring back as much robust data as we get. What it does do is what you're talking about, those leak alerts, right? You can set up that this, both the city and, and you as, as the customer will know if usage starts to, those dials start to spin on that meter. Um, the last I heard, the city had put out an RFQ uh, looking at vendors. Uh, one of the things with the city is that um, they also have about 16,000 electric meters, mainly concentrated downtown. And so whatever system they buy, they have to take uh, thought to those electric meters they have as well. They're not, that's not ours. We do uh, probably sell them the power uh, for that. The answer is yes, the city is looking at some things. Um, and certainly, if they selected the same vendor we're using, there's some possibilities using the backbone, the network that we stood up that could do that. But 
I, I don't know what their timeline is. I do know that they were putting out, you just kind of hear things in the industry, and I do know they were looking at that. Yeah? Cybersecurity is interesting. What steps have you taken to protect the security Yeah, yeah. So, uh, as with all things technical, you know, we, we've been through um, um, our, let me talk about our vendors for a little bit. You know, the, the technology solution is a company called Silver Spring Networks. Uh, they were a small Silicon Valley startup back in 2008. Uh, they've grown quite in stature. Uh, they are providing the solution for two of the California utilities, I think SCNE, Southern California Edison, and I can't remember Pacific Corp, maybe. Anyways, uh, they provided the solution for um, uh, ComEd in Chicago, ConEd in New York, uh, as well as Florida Power and Light, uh, Silver Spring, their network solutions. Um, our, uh, the, the, the testing that has gone on, the security protocols with, with Silver Spring, uh, we've, we've also tested with our security uh, team. Uh, we've done intrusion testing, um, you know, verified software, making sure that you know, everything's up to date with patches on firmware, on the meters, on the, uh, on the, the relays and the boxes themselves. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's as secure as I say as we can make it. Uh, I fully trust that, um, you know, our, our security team here at AEP uh, um, has done a thorough job of vetting that and ensuring that the, the, the data is secure that we're bringing back. Um, there is one thing I should mention too that, that does ca cause some concern uh, from a security perspective is that every meter that we're installing has what's called a soft switch in it. So we can message out to the meter and it's just a circuit. We can open close it, the switch in the meter uh, from a message. Um, uh, it, it's, it's really nice for us because um, if you move out and there's nobody moving in to where you live at uh, for you know a period of time, we can disconnect the service. Uh, we're not ha experiencing line loss if somebody uh, comes in and tries to do some renovation work or something like that. They have to call us and open an account. And we'll be more happy to turn it back on. Um, and then also some of you may have started receiving, if you have the AMI meter and had it uh, for a while, um, we've sent out notifications in the mail where the commission has actually given us permission to extend out from Northeast Columbus where for uh, disconnects for non-pay we can do those remotely as well. Uh, we've had a lot, a lot of new notification for customers, but uh, if you see those notifications in the mail, we were uh, asked by both, uh, we were required by the um, commission and we were asked by the Consumers Council to send these out to all customers so they were aware. Um, without getting into too much detail, uh, that's the security. Yes? There are more and more homes I see putting in uh, backup generators. Yeah. And if you have the ability to turn off power, what's the uh, opportunity to offer uh, uh, interruptible rates to residential customers who have backup meters, backup generators, where during a real serious peak, you can take a lot of homes offline? Yeah. That opportunity is available today, actually. Uh, we do have. Uh, for for all, all of our AP Ohio customers, I would assume the other utilities in the state too, if you install on-site generation, typically a solar panel, it's called our net metering tariff. And it's an it's a, it's a actual um, commission um, prescribed amount that uh, all the kilowatt hours that, wow, I'm used to moving when I talk. I don't, yeah, so standard lectern. If, if you, um, but all the, the excess capacity that, that you push out, we measure both, we call it delivered and received. If that nets out that you delivered more than you received, we pay you. That tariff exists today. Um, the actual practice is, uh, you live in central Ohio, it's sunny now, it won't be tomorrow, right? Uh, <laughs> this is the way it is here in, in Columbus. The uh, uh, most net metered customers end up saving, uh, but they don't end up making a lot of money on the generation. Uh, yes? Something quite different when you're facing a great emergency. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. The ability to take customers offline right now right. and reduce the demand on the grid. And push it out. Technically, you now, with these meters, should have the available. Right. You know, that's interesting. I haven't, I'm not on the billing side of this. I, I, I would assume, and I hate to assume, I, I, but yes, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get an answer to that question. I, I'm, I've never really thought about that. Yeah. The rates I know of are for major industrial. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I got you. Sorry about that. I misunderstood the question. Yeah. Um, on the uh, shutoff in the event of uh, an 
overload on the grid. Uh, would, would there be a mechanism for identifying households that have special medical needs, for instance, that would have insulin that would spoil, or someone on a CPAP machine who would suffocate if their machine was turned off in the middle of the night? Yeah. All of the protections that we have in place because, you know, we could roll out and manually shut off that customer today by pulling the meter. They all still exist. Uh, we have um, several designations on accounts. One of them, which is the most um, restrictive, is called life support. For just the situations you're talking about, doctor fills out a letter, sends it to us. We put that life support. Uh, it pushes out the life support designation on all orders. They get put into our, our outage tickets so that we know that we've got life support customers. That's some of the prioritization that's done for outage restoration. And um, it's also uh, is going to restrict us. We're building uh, safeguards in our system. We're just going to turn that switch off in those meters, those life support customers, so they won't be able to be disconnected remotely. Yes? I love getting an email when there's a power outage. Thank you for doing that. And yeah. almost every email has, you can tell you're over, how do I say, you're over, pro, or over promise, under promising, meaning we hope to have you back on by 7 o'clock tonight and usually you're back on at 5 o'clock tonight. Um, so thank you. That's always good to hear. What percentage of your customers have above ground power lines that are the ones at risk versus underground? And are you doing anything to try and shift more of it to underground so there's less power outages? Or is it just too cost prohibitive to do that? We like underground uh, service for the very reasons that you um, that you state. I think in Columbus, I'm going to throw out a number. I don't work in the distribution, but I, I would estimate, particularly when you go out in the you know out into the suburbs, um, it's probably about 50-50. Right? That that'd be probably be a good number to work with. I don't know, Renee, if you've got a better number than that that you've heard before. Um, it is cost prohibitive because it's very expensive to put those um, put those lines underground. Uh, some of the things that we are doing, you know, with the above ground lines, is uh, we're being really aggressive with our tree trimming. Um, I know, I know. I, I, I hear a couple groans every time I say that, but you know, it's it's you think about like ice storms come through and you've got double whammy. You know, the, the lines, uh, the trees go down, but they don't fall. They hit our lines. Uh, because the tree branches are up in the lines and then the ice melts and the tree comes flying back up. Um, it's, it's one of the easiest ways to, to help and ensure that we don't, uh, we don't lose, our, lose our lines in both wind storms and power storms. Um, cost prohibitive, I mean, I think we're going to pursue projects, you know, where we try to put, uh, put, put lines underground, certainly all new constructions that way. So, but eventually, the lines are above ground somewhere. I live down in Grove City. You saw all that news where we had the tornado blew through and took transmission lines out. Uh, for I was out of town when that happened, so and I didn't experience an outage. Okay, so I um, I have a whole bunch of other slides which I think I'm going to not go through. I do want to talk about Smart City though, real quick. So, um, you all have heard of the Smart City project, or at least read about it? It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's been uh, highly publicized. I, I'm really proud. Just, I'm a long time, or lifelong Columbus resident, born and raised on the uh, west side of Columbus. Uh, development's called River Bend, uh, out off Alkire Road. Um, to see the city that I grew up in, and, and I like living here, and I don't plan to leave. Well, until I retire, but um, I, I don't know. I plan to leave. The um, to win, and the cities we were competing against. You know, I've, I've been to Austin. That's a fun town. I've not been to Seattle, but you hear it's fun. And for us to go out and win the Smart City Project, that we've got, you know, the the right, um, the, the right mix of uh, business, uh, residential, and, and we've got the, the right uh, population um, density, the right population um, diversity, that, that we're really going to ring and test out these technologies. You know, so if you imagine a city where um, driverless vehicles transport residents to and from work, where driving electric vehicles is the norm rather than the exception, where street lights are equipped with smart monitoring controls that allow for two-way communication and where the use of microgrids keep the power flowing to police and fire stations, hospitals, and other critical facilities serving public safety needs during these outages. It may be hard to imagine, but soon these new and innovative technological advancements and much more will be a reality because of the Smart Columbus Initiative. AP Ohio, we're playing a major role in this project. We're always looking ahead. We're looking to participate in a project in Columbus um, that we're currently testing, and we're rolling it out. What makes sense and what works? We're participating in the planning of the future. Um, the, um, the project itself uh, was put out. Uh, cities submitted um, 
contracts, or not contracts, submitted um, proposals of how they would implement Smart City. Uh, it started with a uh, Department of Transportation, um, uh, bi um, not bid, but uh, uh, dollars. It was a funding from the Department of Transportation. Uh, Paul Allen uh, got involved. His company was called Vulcan, and uh, they put up some, uh, some funding for this as well, and a lot of other uh, companies have joined in, uh, contributing both uh, uh, dollars and in-kind contributions. Uh, the first thing I think that you're going to see that we're involved in is uh, we just recently got permission from the Public Utilities Commission to help fund some um, um, charging stations, both quick charge and, and the slower trickle charge stations. These are mostly going to be in commercial type establishments where um, a Kroger or, you know, I don't mean to call it Kroger specifically, but a, a grocery store chain could install some here, all, all within Columbus and the six contiguous counties. But it, it's starting down that path to, to what do we look like from not just electricity, but energy in the future. And um, I've seen some, some really exciting technologies that, they're, that are available to bring over that AMI, not AMI network we're building. So um, um, our, our smart meter project is certainly, uh, and both the distribution automation VDO is a big part of the uh, of the um, Smart Cities project as well here. So. In Westerville, we have our own electric division. Yeah. In the Smart, in the AMIs, are those yours? No, they were not ours. Yeah, that, that's a separate electric grid. So if you live out in Pickerington, South Central, um, I think South Central, the co-op, has drive-by. I call them semi-smart meters. They're not bringing it back over a network. And I think Westerville did go AMI. Um, they may be using the same system that we're using, though, Silver Spring. Yes. So, what do you feel about the uh, effect on the grid stability and things like that of electric vehicles? Electric vehicles? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'm not really qualified to, to talk about that per se, just because I'm not, you know, an engineer. Um, I, I know that uh, that I, I think what I've read is the long-term goal is that using that battery as a storage, where we're talking about, you know, in times of crisis, pushing out. Um, you know, uh, trying to provide power while we're in an outage situation. And, and I, I think, and this is, again, from what I've read, you know, in the, um, the same stuff that's available to all of us, is that that's probably where this is heading. But I'm not an expert. Yeah, sorry. Any other questions? Well, listen, I thank you very much for your time. Um, Columbus Rotary's thanks to Rotarian and uh, AEP employee Renee for bringing uh, Steve James today. It was certainly much more than I expected. I thought when they put the automatic meter uh, reader on my home earlier this summer, it was just the easy way for them to build and get rid of your jobs. I didn't realize it was a proactive service feature. That's maybe a best kept secret. So very good for sharing that with us today. And we'd like to also share with AEP, they've been a, a regular contributor to our student service of ourself year after year. And we thank AEP for that tremendous financial support. We just thank you for joining today. This will be adjourned.